Music is seminal to our lives, from our first lullaby to our wedding dance to whatever dirge they may play at our funeral. Songs mark both our most important moments and hum in the background of our daily lives. Where music came from and why is a long contested subject among musicologists. Yes, that's a field. How cool, right? Several theories captured in a paper called The Psychological Functions of Music Listening trace its beginnings as a necessary aspect of evolution. Suggesting that someone who made music had a biological edge in mating, guess that cliche about being in a band to attract others goes way back, another evolutionary idea links the need to soothe babies via music as being critical to allow mothers to move on to other important survival activities. A different line of thinking points to the use of music for bringing people together. Consider this quote. Musical activities appear to have been present in every known culture on earth, with ancient roots extending back 250,000 years or more. Work and war songs, lullabies, and national anthems have bounded together families, groups, or whole nations. Relatedly, music may provide a means to reduce social stress and temper aggression in others. In this extensive review of existing research, the authors of the paper I mentioned bring together over 129 different reasons why we listen to music, derived from past studies. In thinking about the role music plays in helping us move up, three of the top factors struck me. Because it reminds me of certain periods of my life and past experiences. Because it makes me believe I am better able to cope with my worries. Because it can make me dream. All three of those factors are critical in having a better understanding and appreciation for all that it takes to move up in life. We need to look back to appreciate where we came from. We need help so things can get better today. And we need to have hope for a better future. Think about your own life. What songs make you appreciate your past, overcome a current challenge, or dream of a better future? What would be the soundtrack to your life? I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with musician, producer, and songwriter Johnny Most Davis. His first number one hit was at the age of 24, and since then he's worked with artists such as Roger Daltrey, Mary J. Blige, Biggie Smalls, Outkast, Usher, and Pink. All told, he's had 25 gold and platinum records to his credit. In our conversation, you'll hear that he doesn't define success by the billboard charts and that the people that contributed to where he is today are far from household names. Have a listen. I hope you enjoy. So, you know, I'm a big fan of like serendipity, like just sometimes things happen. And I was thinking, uh, I don't know if you remember, just do you remember the first time we met? We had just been robbed. (gasps) Oh, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> so, yeah. and, I, and I think you know how this story goes, but we had just been robbed. I was the prime suspect. And you were the prime suspect. We <laughs> saw we saw you and Maria coming up the driveway. And I want to think that you had uh, just, I think, you, I, I'm thinking you took your motor, you drove your motorcycle up the driveway and then you came walking towards our door and we're like, man, they're back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're I'm back. back more. Yeah. And so, so we had this sort of sense of, of dread, <laughs> you know, like, wow, they, they must not know we're here. They're coming back. And, you know, <laughs> and I think you may have been like, you know, sporting some, some, some leather and you had this sort of look to you that was a little intimidating. And it was just one of those crazy things that like, you know, who would know that it'd be like, you know, so many years later and we're sort of still friends and my first impression. What do you mean, sort not... of still friends? <laughs> no, Come on, I mean, man. We're still friends. But my point is, like, my first impression could not have been any 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 worse. Right. right? When I knocked on the door, I remember. I don't know if you remember this. I heard the <laughs> who's there loading the shotgun. <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's not how we rolled. But I mean, yes, yeah, so it is. It <laughs> yeah. is very funny. I, I mean, do remember. My- and my you, blood ran cold. Yeah, you brought a lovely bottle of wine, and it yeah. was the beginning of a of, of a great friendship, as the movie says. So, uh, yeah. I was just sort of thinking, like this sort of notion of like just serendipity and how things happen. And you know, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of your your work in, in music. Uh, but but it's 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 sort of uh, jumps out at me that when we think about music, we often think about sort of like big breaks. 
and someone had luck or someone was seen at the right time or something like that. And I, I'm wondering if you just sort of like, you know, reflect a little bit on, uh, about sort of just the role that like luck and fortune have had uh, throughout sort of like your, your trajectory in music. When I was at Berkeley College of Music, um, I desperately wanted a chance to clean the studios as my job. And they would pay me to do that. And I remember I couldn't get that job. I couldn't get that job. And then one day I opened up my little mailbox at school and I was hired to do that job to clean the studios after midnight every day. But I got the keys to all of the studios in the school. And I had this privilege that none of the other kids had. And I, uh, I, that's when actually I swear my life turned around when I got the job just to clean vacuum dust, the studios from midnight until 6 AM and everything changed from that. I was able to have access to teachers that I would not have had access to and to the knowledge that they had. And, uh, all the questions I had about recording and, and mixing and producing and playing. I had access to that. And, uh, I'll never forget that. Two things that sort of jumped in my mind. One is I would never consider you someone who's gotten your break, getting your break cleaning. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that you say that. You should see my sink full of dishes. Actually, yeah. you should smell my sink full of dishes right now. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's so funny. It reminds me, by the way, I was trying to convince my mom uh, a couple weeks ago that the new iPhones, you could actually sort of uh, transport smell through the phone. <laughs> but that's also, you know, it's interesting because that's, uh, and I'm, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of his name, but that's also how Jimmy um, Iovine got his name, right? Or got, got his break, right? I don't know exactly how Jimmy Iovine got his break, but I do know that he was hired to be a recording engineer for Tom Petty, but he brought his own recording engineer, Shelly Yakis, and, um, and Tom and Jimmy Iovine became the co-producer with Tom Petty on the biggest records Tom Petty's made. Yeah, Jimmy Iovine was a janitor, I think, at that recording studio first. That's and exactly I, what I was. Yeah, you also so you also you also mentioned uh, Berkeley, right? So one of the one of the best uh, music schools in the country, right? And it's so funny because I think that you know people sometimes can uh, un- underappreciate sort of you know uh, the study and the skill that goes into into music, right? Just sort of like, you know, if you pick up your guitar and you, and you play for 10,000 hours, or whatever, you'll, you'll, you'll be great. Right. But, uh, but beyond sort of the access you got there, I'm just wondering, like, when you go, when you think back to that experience, like, are there, uh, teachers or instructors or people who are like, man, you know, that person really, you know, uh, rocked my world or opened something to me that I, I previously maybe would not have, have really gotten, uh, uh yeah. a connection to. My teachers were just like, they were just so good. Uh, uh, there's a couple that come to mind that really helped form my direction. I'll tell you one thing. I had one of the teachers ask me, and this is, of course, you know, after I was done cleaning the studios, I had access, you know, to them. Yeah. And one of them asked me, um, Johnny, who do you think your competition is? And I said, well, my, my fellow students. And they said, no, when you get out of here, you're going to be competing for jobs with the best of the best. And that's where your head should be. It shouldn't be, you know, such a, a, a micro thing. It should be more of a macro. And, um, and that changed the way I thought about everything from then on. I had to be so much better than I was not, not, not I was I was very good in school, but when you start thinking about comparing yourself to a Bob Clear Mountain or a Shelly Yakis, or a, a, you know, a, I mean, the list goes on and on. But um, that's where everything changed for me, and uh, and it was a very uh, integral point, pivot yeah. in uh, in my thinking. What even got, what even brought you to Berkeley? I mean, where did the where did the love for music uh, come from? Well, my father was a drummer my whole life. My mother was a singer, and um, 
I only ever applied to one school. And if I didn't get in, I never have a, a backup plan. Bob. <laughs> I, I, I have never had a backup plan. That was my only plan was Berkeley College of Music. I think it was instilled in me at a very young age, but that's where I was going. And if I wasn't going to go there, I don't know what I would have done. I don't, I just don't know. So I can't believe I've known you all these years and I had no idea that your, your dad was a drummer and your mom sang. Yeah. Oh, my father was a really good drummer. And my mother uh, was like a cabaret singer. What were the sounds that were streaming through your house then when you were growing up? A lot of out of tune guitars, a <laughs> piano that needed tuning, a mother that would sing, uh, Welcome Home, Bill Bailey, <laughs> you know? I mean, all these old songs and Barney Kessel uh, on guitar. And, you know, my father turned me on to jazz at a really young age and, and he used to play it, big band uh, jazz. And uh, I, I love to this day big band, you know, music, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett. Yeah, that's a far cry from my experience growing up, which I uh, lovingly recall, you know, a lot of Neil Diamond, which I still love to this day, but often sort of sitting in a car with my my mom and my sister, my brother, and sort of singing very loudly and only occasionally getting the lyrics right. <laughs> so I, I know. I used to just, I, I would listen to the radio and I never understood really what they were saying until years and years later. I was actually because I would always listen to the melody and I would listen to the production, but I wasn't listening to the lyrics until way later on in my life. And then I hear songs from the 70s. I'm like, that's what they were saying. Oh, my God. So, you know, uh, my mom uh, was a bartender most of my uh, most of my childhood. So we would go into the bar and we would hear the jukebox that was playing and often we would have Motown songs. So I I also grew up listening to uh, to Barry White. But, but I had no idea what he was actually talking about. And then I'm older. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. That's what my mother let me listen to? Yeah. Right. I was looking at some of the people you've worked with, right? And again, it spans decades. And it's a pretty, it's like an, a pretty amazing list, you know, in terms of, you know, types of artists, in terms of style of music. And when when you look, when you look back at the people that you've, you know, mixed, produced, written for, it must sort of be a wild sort of feeling, right? It is because the thing is, is that like, if you, you know, Google what I've done or, or you look at the body of work that I've had, what you're not seeing is all the misses. Those are all the wins, right? But there's so many more misses that don't show up when you Google it. And, um, and I think about a lot of those as well, you know, a lot of those as well, the misses. Now, why do you think that is? Um, because they've made a much bigger mark in my mind than the wins. I learned way more from the misses than I did the wins. That's why. It's interesting that like there's some psychology behind that where just in general in our lives, we're much more tuned to you know, what maybe you're calling sort of misses or, you know, the, the heads and headwinds we face, the challenges, then we are sort of the tailwinds, the things that sort of push us forward. Um, and so I wonder if that's sort of, you know, uh, an example of that where you're just sort of like the, the misses are sticking with you. And, you know, objectively, if, if you look at sort of working with, you know, the folks that you've worked with from Mary J. Blige to, you know, you know, Johnny Mathis and Roger <laughs> Daltrey and Notorious B.I.G. and mm. Outcast and, you know, all these people, even today where you've got Pink and, you know, help, you know, discover American authors. I mean, it, it really is sort of like a, a small, not even a small, but it's sort of an interesting sort of um, window into music over the last, you know, you know, 20, 30 years. I got lucky on a lot of things, you know, like Outkast, well, Biggie. Like I fell into like um, artists that were culturally moving along, you know. It's really remarkable when I look back at it. But I got to tell you, Bob, I think I look at it in an opposite way. I think the losses were the wind, were the, uh, wind at my back, not, not the winds. I, 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 the wins were great, but 
you could, I couldn't predict what was, what I didn't know Biggie would become Biggie Smalls, man. I mean, <laughs> who would know that or right. outcast and, you know, TLC would become like th- this culturally changing music, you know? Um, I, I just didn't know that at the time, but I had a, I had a shrink once and I loved this girl. And I said, Jane, man, um, I, I just feel like there's a hundred mile an hour wind in my face. And she said, turn around. Right. So the, <laughs> right. And I, I said, Jane, I just feel like I'm being pounded by waves, man. She said, duck. And I'll tell you, Bob, that's what I've been doing. But I will say this, that every win I had, I always felt like a fraud. Every single one. I always thought I was going to be found out because I always felt like I had half the talent as the guy next to me. And I just had to put that much more work into it. And the way I look at things, and I still do, no matter what it is that I'm doing, I, um, I feel like 90% of the work takes 10% of the time. And that extra 10% takes 90% of the time. What you just described, Johnny, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but like imposter syndrome yeah, is like a real thing, right? Yeah. This well, to me of, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, to me as well. It's this notion of like, you know, either you're not good enough or you know, when you're on a good run, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like this can't last. That's right. Um, and it's challenging. And some of it, you know, you, you, I've always tried to figure out like where it comes from. And, you know, some could be, you know, maybe there wasn't enough encouragement in certain parts of your life, or there's some people who seem to just walk through life with this sense of confidence about everything, which I, you know, I- admire, um, in some degree, although sometimes you see it where it sort of leads to a little hubris and, and, and bad decisions. But, but you know, going back to the uh, the wind in your face thing, it reminds me. Uh, you remember the the football player Steve Young, quarterback yeah, for the Niners. Yeah, yeah. So he used to say that every game when he took the field, he you know uh, he would act as if when they were on offense that he would just close his eyes and open them up and envision that the direction he was moving was downhill, just by a slight degree, like five degrees that they were moving downhill on, on offense. And then at halftime, when you know they changed sides of the field, he would close his eyes again and tilt the field in the other direction. Really? Yeah, just this sort of sense, sense of like mental, you know, this mental imagery of how you're about to move forward. Are you moving forward into the wind? Are you going downhill? I mean, you know, I think that's a, you know, can be a strong sort of motivator for how someone approaches, you know, a project, a day, um, and even a life. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, um, because one thing sort of interesting, you know, about life in general, but also it sort of really comes through in music, that that music sometimes um, can be a medium of sorrow and um, and tragedy, right? That so, so, so much of music is sort of writing about various sorts of challenges, sometimes, um, you know, with a happy ending, but also more often not, right? Um, Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what is it about sort of music? Um, and I know I'm sort of making a huge generalization there yeah. where artists are, are prone to, you know, putting that sorrow out in front or sharing sort of stories that, you know, aren't sort of always, you know, uh, triumphant. It's the human condition and everybody could relate. It's like talking to you about the weather, Right. Everybody has had heartache. Everybody has been through, you know, their own turmoil. And it's very relatable. Was you, you just know that there are people in your life, you know, who were as smart as you were or worked as hard, you know, or, you know, had a lot of things, you know, that, that, that you, you would have thought that they would have done great, right? But then they had other things that didn't break their way. And they had different life outcomes, you know, and you just sort of wonder, you know, like, you know, why, you know, why was I fortunate and why weren't they? I, I'll tell you, um, what, what do they say? Uh, imitation is the best form of flattery or something like, that. you know, I would study records. I'd spend all day 
studying records. And I would learn the chord progressions that uh, other you know, artists, musicians, producers yeah, yeah, were yeah. using. And I would, I would use the same ones, but I would write a different melody. And I would listen to the form of the song. And I had other friends who just were not doing what I was doing. And it doesn't matter how much you tell them, you know, um, it's, it's, you, you have to do it for yourself. Like when I started as a mixing engineer, which is how I started. And I might say had my first number one hit at 24 years old, man, you know, it was because I emulated what Bob Clear Mountain did. And I listened to the Hall and Oates Big Bam Boom album. Do you remember that album? Yeah. That was produced and mixed so well, but he did David Bowie Let's Dance, you know, with Niall Rogers producing and the delays that he put on Niall's guitars and 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 things like that made that record. I think they cut that record in like 17 days. The whole album, it was wow. it was cut and mixed in 17 days. <laughs> Who does that today? The, you know, the musicians aren't all gathered in a room to cut records today, you know? You just reminded me of a, a of a scarring childhood memory, <laughs> which is, which is <laughs> don't I always which is music based. Uh, it reminded me like when I wa- when I moved from uh, from Boston to Pennsylvania. At one point, we were you know in class. I guess it was like sixth grade, and um, we were all asked to name like you know what music we were listening to or what we really liked, and uh, and you know this was in rural Pennsylvania, so. Uh, the new school. And um, so I mentioned Hall and Oates. And I, oh my goodness, the kids were ruthless. <laughs> you know, like, were they? Like, yeah, like, you know, all of a sudden, like, oh, who likes Hall and Oates and, you know, all kinds of other things that I won't repeat here. But it was just like, oh man, you know. But it was interesting because, you know, for me, you know, music is one of those things that it's like an emotional sap, right? So, you know, uh, you don't want to betray your own taste and the music that sort of speaks to you. Um, and, and there is something to, to go to what you're talking about in terms of imitation is one of the things I've always admired about sort of musicians, um, is that how much they honor the music of the past and the traditions. They're inspired by it. They're knowledgeable of it. They, they borrow from it, but they do so in a way that is, that's honoring it and acknowledges it. Right. And, uh, and one of the things I've always enjoyed about the Grammy shows is when they sort of do these tributes and you have all these musicians playing, you know, music that they grew up, grew up to, you know, in honor of someone who's, you know, either being, um, honored at the Grammys or the rock and roll hall of fame or shows like that. And, uh, th- there does seem to just be such camaraderie and appreciation and respect that's sort of baked into the profession that, that maybe you don't see in other places. Yeah. You know, the thing about it is like those guys, uh, I remember I was, I was at the Grammys. I'm a voting member of the Grammys. Did you know that? I, no, I don't think I did. Yeah. And I was, I was at the, uh, the, the, this concert, a benefit for Bob Dylan and everybody played, you know, but when you look at those, those musicians from the past, you see, like music used to be a written and read language um, and it, universal, global, right? And it we're really losing that, aren't we? You know, the, the producer, like what I always say, Bob, is that it's open mic night for the world right now. Everybody with a laptop thinks they're a producer and a songwriter. And it's just not that way. Um, but... Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the old timers, I'm not saying they're better, you know, because a lot of people like my mother doesn't even know how to FaceTime. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> These kids now, they have this technology that like is mind blowing uh, how advanced it is. But at the same time, you know, I used to sit in a room and set up a, a ton of microphones and get the drum sounds that we're going to use for that session. Now you just hit a, you hit a key on a keyboard and that sound just miraculously appears. It's not miraculous 
there's somebody who's creating these libraries of sounds. But back then, recording was a science. It was an art, you know? Um, and I'll tell you, what the kids have today, I have all that stuff. And I, I'm making records right now, you know, especially, I hate to say it, but COVID, with COVID going on, I have to sit here in a room by myself and create all the tracks, sing all the background vocals, send it to the artist, let him lay in his, his vocal track. You know, I mean, I'm doing the same thing. But um, it's just not the same, is it, Bob? You know, running a recording studio back then was like being in a spaceship and being right. uh, Captain Kirk, you know? Yeah, you know, it does make you wonder, though, like, if uh, you're right, you know, the idea that it is open mic for everyone. On one hand, you know, it can, it can you know, lead to people being discovered that maybe wouldn't have been before, people who have a unique voice and something to say. Yeah, there was a gatekeeper before, yeah. and there's not yeah. anymore. Yeah, but uh, but you do. To you, I think maybe the point you're also raising is that you know, it, it, you can also it can also be a shortcut, right? Where you don't have to sort of learn the things that maybe are going to be helpful to have that progression as an artist that allow you to not just have a couple hits, but to you know have this long sustained career and to contribute music that you know generations from now they'll still be listening to it and be like, wow, they really captured what was going on at that time. I just don't think music is as important today as it used to be. That's what I think. I think that um, artists hit it huge with one hit song and basically sell out. They become a brand. They make perfume. They make clothing. You know, um, and that path was, you know, uh, when was it started? I don't know. But when you look at Puffy, who I worked with, uh, you know, a lot, he, he, I think he makes a lot more money on his branding than he does on music anymore, you know, but it's, it's hard to compare with him because he's, he's a monster. He, he, he discovered, he discovered Mary J. He discovered Puffy. I mean, I'm sorry, Biggie, you know? So, I mean, you know, but a lot of people have taken that, that route, like, yeah. um, you know, 50 cent, right? Right. Does he make music anymore? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, but he still makes money. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station WNET in New York, reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org backslash chasing the dream. And now back to our conversation. You know, when you think about sort of music as a business, right, versus mm. music as an art form, yeah, uh, it reminds me, you know, of a story or a theory you told me a while ago. I don't know if you remember this, um, but I use it actually in my in, in the classes I teach now, which is um, sort of the a common trait that links bands that stay together and are successful. Do you remember this? I do. I I do. The secret is, oftentimes, the lead singer writes the songs and um, makes all the money and the band really, really has a, uh, they lash out about that. And um, it, the bands that make it all equal, like whoever writes what, um, and then it, it just says written by Queen, right? Yep. Uh, they stay together. They tend to stay together. The bands that share everything equally tend to stay together. I watched the David Foster uh, movie recently. Yep. And the same thing happened with the band Chicago, right? Like um, David Foster came in, Chicago 16. I remember that album. David Foster wrote those songs with uh, the lead singer. And after that album, Peter left yep. to pursue a solo career. Yeah. You know? And that band is still bitter about that album, no matter how big it was. They're wow. still bitter about the album. And it's interesting because it goes right back to the point that you just made. It's interesting, though, because some people would look at sort of, you know, music as sort of like this sort of uh, often an example of individual success, like the lead man in a band or a solo artist, um, when it is truly like a team sport. Yeah. Now, let me ask a question. So when I ask you, if I were asking you to reflect back on sort of your career in music, like how would you define your own success there? Like, what are you most proud of? What's your sort of, you know, things that you would sort of point to? 
That's a really good question. One of the things I am proud of is, like I said, having a number one hit at such a young age. I was 24. I didn't know how to deal with that, you know? I mean, I was so young, I used to wear a tie to the studio because my assistant really wanted my job, you know? But I had my own style. I taught myself. Nobody taught me how to mix. I didn't go through the studio system. Like, my best friend in life is Tony Maserati. He's he's one of the top five mixers in the world. And, and he still is. You know, he does everything. I wasn't... Uh, I, and I, I met him in college, but I didn't come up the way he did. He went through the studio system and I did not. Um, so I just made it up as I went along. And, you know, other people would copy some of the things that I was doing. And I remember, I remember this, Bob, I had the number one hit on the hot 100 at the time. And I decided to quit, um, and become a full-time songwriter because I talked to one of my best friends and I said, who's not in music. And I said, you know, I know I could write better songs than this, man, that that's coming across my desk. And he said, Johnny, everybody's got 2000 bad songs in them. You might as well start right now. <laughs> I, I quit mixing at, at, with a number one hit on the chart. And um, I was writing full time. And then I got, you know, I got a massive deal with Columbia Records and, and uh, but, you know, it took time. I remember the very first good song I wrote that did not sound contrived. That was from the heart, but commercial. I remember I didn't go anywhere, but I remember, <laughs> you know. So now I'm sort of dying. So now what was the song? That 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 you that you felt proud of. Do you remember the lyrics? Yes, I do. Well, it was called Mother, and I don't remember the lyrics offhand. But uh, uh, you know, next time we talk, I, I could tell you. I mean, I remember some of them, but they're irrelevant at the moment. But it, it was it was about my mother. Yeah, and my childhood, and it was the first time I had written a song that like. Um, was meaningful and heartfelt and i brought it to an amazing songwriter artist called gerard mcmahon and he loved it and gerard mcmahon wrote he wrote cry little sister do you know that he's still touring off of that song wow so i i was i was his engineer i was his mixing engineer and he didn't know me as a songwriter and i was very insecure about it and um I played it for him and he loved it. He thought it sounded like uh, John Lennon. You should you should uh, dig that song up somewhere. You know, I, I was just listening um, in our home. I Have you heard the song um, uh, Mother's Smile? I'm not sure. I'm it's terrible by, with titles. Yeah, yeah it's by a, an artist named Keelan Donovan. And it's, it's relatively new. And I forget, one of the lyrics is something like, my mother's smile, it looks the same as it was when I was a child endearing sort of sense of of this one thing that despite sort of you know wrinkles and age the smile is something that still will stay stay with you you know it's just a beautiful song i think songs about our moms um you know are so uh transcendent you know because it speaks to such a an important relationship in our in our lives and and especially like for you know uh guys who sometimes want to you know be macho and whatnot um really allows the sort of convey something that so many of us feel but don't always feel comfortable sharing with our own moms yeah yeah so tell me about the uh what number are you up to in the 2000 bad song count <laughs> i think i hit that bro <laughs> <laughs> i hit that man, one day, i, I had you, like ten thousand hours man yeah yeah when you got the, when you got the 2000 song did you like there it is i'm gonna frame this yeah i heard it on the radio yeah. that's <laughs> surreal that's surreal like when you hear a song that you wrote and it's on the radio, you know, I wrote a song. Uh, you, you, we were talking about American authors a minute ago, but um, the follow up single to Best Day of My Life, you, you know the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be the best day of my life. I wrote the, fo I co wrote the follow up single, Go Big or Go Home. Yeah, it's a great and song. Coca Cola licensed the title from us and printed it on a Coke can. And, and like when I held that can, 
I've never been able to touch like a lyric that I wrote before. And wow. it, was, it was very strange. I have a couple of cans laying around, Bob, if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Well, I remember even as a friend, um, you know, where you had just uh, worked and written um, with, uh, with Pink, God is a DJ. Yeah. And I remember just feeling pride for you in yeah. hearing it. Awesome it was to be able to say like, "Hey, my son, my friend, that's him," and I can only imagine what it would be like if it were if it if it were mine, you know. I, I gotta tell you, a lot of the biggest wins that I've had always came with some sort of personal turmoil mm. underneath the bottom of it. The success that that you've had, that I have had, a lot of people, you know, a, a lot of people don't really share. Yeah. And, and, and I, I want to tell you a quick story, Bob, I think that you'd appreciate this. Okay. Hey, go for it. I'm up here in my, my, uh, underground lair in Vermont right now, hiding out from what's going on in the world at the moment. Right. And I was seeing a shrink and I was talking, you know, about this and that. I was saying, oh, yeah. You know, I used to be partners with Roger Daltrey, <laughs> you know, uh, lead singer of The Who. Or, or yeah, I did Mary J. Or or whatever. I found Charlie XCX, Bob. You know, I love it. <laughs> you know that song, yeah. right? And um, she, I, I, I started making a TV show. Because uh, I was like, well, what's the next thing? And... I, I was like, you know, this seems pretty cool. So uh, I had somebody working for me, and he's from Vermont, a redneck from Vermont, who I loved, but he died. And he gave me the expression, a flat, flatlander. He said, he used to say, you're flat. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that, Bob? And he goes, you're a flatlander. And then he explained to me, and then I started looking it up, Flatlander. What a great name for a show, you know? So I'm going to start making a, a show. I'm telling the shrink. I'm going to start making a show called Flatlander. And she said, Johnny, do you feel like you suffer from delusions of grandeur? And I <laughs> said, well, yeah, I do. But so do all my friends, you know? And that's the difference, Bob, is like, like we have these ideas and somehow I get blinders on and like, I'll actually do it and I'll achieve a dream that I have failing miserably along the way. Okay. But I'll be able to do it and follow through with it. And my biggest, uh, my, my best and worst quality as a human being is the inability to quit at anything I put my mind to man. And like, it could be a really bad quality, Bob, when you don't know when to quit, you yeah. know, but, um, I just, I always found that to be really funny that she just didn't get me like, delusions of grandeur. Do you, do you suffer from delusions of grandeur, Bob? Uh, you know, I can relate to it, but, uh, but it reminds me of, um, did you ever watch the show or watch the show or listen to, uh, Seinfeld's in, in, in the car, you know, getting yeah. coffee with comedians in the car and like, right. And so he had Dave Chappelle on, um, and there's an old episode and I, I was watching it the other night on, on Netflix and Chappelle described it very similar to what you said. He's like, uh, people think that like, you know, Oh, you know, you've got a plan and stuff like that. And he's like, no, he's like, <laughs> it's like, there's an idea and the idea is driving. I'm like yeah. a passenger. I'm a passenger in that car. Yeah. And sometimes I'm in the back seat, sometimes in the front seat. I don't know where we're going, but the idea is driving. Uh, absolutely. Uh, like I said, I, I put blinders on and it's all I get focused on. And some, But I'll tell you this, I don't know if he said this, but when you look back in time, you're like, how on earth did I pull that off? Mm. How did I do that? It is, you know, it's interesting though. It's like, I also find, um, you know, I find it interesting. Like you mentioned sort of the idea of driving you in the blinders. And I was telling the story about sort of Chappelle, but to me, what's interesting too, is that so often, like if the idea is driving that car, you're still sort of smart enough to pause and open the door and let other people in. Right. Because bringing so many, bringing anything to life, you know, even if it's sort of an act that was inspired by an individual requires, 
you know, uh, a lot of people. Right. And so, you know, so, um, you know, even, you know, as, uh, I was thinking about, you know, creating this podcast, right. And I thought about, uh, the music for it. Right. And, you know, I had, you know, a germ of an idea that I wanted it to sort of reflect this. And you, you obviously know the backstory, but, but, you know, I wanted something that was created off of chord progressions where the chord progressions essentially, um, you know, reflected, uh, the initials of, you know, my daughters and my wife. Ah, and, uh, I see where you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, but you know, I couldn't make that right. Um, uh-huh. and I reached out to you and I said, could you help? Right. And, you know, one thing I really respected was that, you know, uh, you know, I could, you know, I, I treated it like a favor, right. Which mm-hmm. in hindsight was disrespectful to your art. I did uh, not um, look at it as a favor. No. I took yeah. it, uh, you know, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And well, what I'm going to say is that what you produce and what people will hear on this, you know, is it's just so beautiful. And and uh, and to me uh, personally, the idea that I was able to collaborate um, with a friend and that friend was able to help bring something to life in a way that was better than I would have imagined. Um, you know, to me as a real sort of like, that's what success is sometimes not like, Hey, look, I did this, but look, look what someone helped me do. Um, or look what someone did with, you know, your direction. Got there. Yeah. Under and, your uh, direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just want to say how much I appreciate it. Right. And I appreciate uh, you saying yeah. that. Really? And, um, and yeah, and it's like I was but, happy you know, to help. Yeah, well, no, I'm you know, uh, it's it really is wonderful, and uh, I'm not you know, I, I'm just doing. I'm telling the story now because it's illustrative, right? Of some of the stuff that we're sort of talking about. Like you know, I had some you know some inspiration of types of things I heard. You you know, obviously you know took it in a, a, an awesome direction, um, and uh, and I just want to acknowledge that, like you know, <laughs> that, that, that things come from a place and that people add value and. And their ideas came from someone else, right? And we're all in this sort of, you know, world, you know, moving forward. And when we're lucky, we're able to stumble onto something together and create something. And uh, and it's great to be able to tell those stories. Yeah, uh, it was it was fun to do. Honestly, Bob, I'll tell you, like when I write, I don't know where it comes from. I mm. don't know why. It just it it flows through me. I listen to some of the, all of the suggestions that you had made and just created some, it just came right out, you know, it's one of those things. And I'm just glad that you're happy. I really am. I want to ask you a question. Shoot. Why are you where you are? How'd that happen? I remember when you were an advertising executive and you quit. Yeah. You were at the like biggest firm in the world. Yeah. From what I remember. Yep. And you quit. Yeah. Where'd you get the balls to do that? Yeah. Um, you know what? It was, uh, you know, you mentioned the sort of the idea of like, you know, 2000 bad songs. Right. And yeah. I came to New York, not knowing a soul and having uh, ideas of the kinds of things I wanted to do and what success looked like. And, you know, money was a part of it and being able to do nice things for your family. Um, and I was able to do some of that. But it was also like there was a feeling where it just felt like empty. Like, you know, what's this all adding up to? Um, and you know, what's, what's my legacy? What am I going to leave behind? And I wanted to, to make things. I wanted to write. I wanted to create things. I wanted to do things in the service of others that might either inspire someone or help them, uh, get to a better station in life. You know, I've been, I've been fortunate and, you know, like you, you look back at sort of like, you know, where you started and where you are and, um, you know, sometimes you can point to like the things that you make, like a book, a piece of music, and that makes you feel good. But I, I look back and, uh, and I'm just like, man, look at all the experiences I had and the people I got to, to meet and work with and help. You know, at the end of at, at the end of any show, right, you know, you normally hear like, you know, someone will sort of talk about the credits and stuff like that and people who produced music by, uh, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about giving the people I talked to a chance to sort of do their own credits, which is to say, like, um, you know, we, I use the term sometimes like, you know, who's on your dream team? Like, you know, like, I want you to think for a second and take the next couple of, you know, however long you want and just rattle off names of people in your life that if you pull them out, 
you wouldn't you wouldn't be where you are today. Yeah, but your listeners aren't going to know these people. It doesn't matter, man. I just think saying their names out loud, it could be one name, could be 10, doesn't matter. But I think the idea of just saying, you know, uh, you know, thanks or this person or that person, you've mentioned a couple already. If you don't want to, that's completely cool. But, no, man, yeah. no, I'm just thinking like Kevin Dixon, the, my boss when I was a student and I was cleaning the studios and unfortunately he recently died, man. Um, but he was, uh, an integral part of what I feel my success was look, but the thing is, Bob, is I haven't always been successful and I would mention my ex-wife, Maria, yeah. she yeah. was amazing as yeah. far as being supportive. And, um, and right now, you know, I'm running an independent, uh, record company and music publishing company. Tony Maserati, you know, best friend in life, said, hey, man, I'm having a baby. Why don't you come in and, and, and take over and run my company? I just don't want to do it anymore. You know, he want, he's older and he wants to focus on his baby. And, who, you know, who would criticize him for that? Yeah. So I came in to run his company. And, um, you know, and I, I appreciate that. And my partner, Mike Selvern, He's so inspirational to me. He's, he's, you would just never see him coming and he's the smartest guy in the room and you just never know it. Like he's one of the, uh, I mean, certainly top five um, music publishing entertainment lawyers in the world. And I'm so lucky. I met him back in college. I, how about David Sonnenberg who managed Meatloaf, man? And, you know, made me, a I went into David Sonnenberg's office. He's like, I could never remember your name. I said, well, all my friends call me Johnny most. And he slammed on his desk, you know, and he said, that's it. Never take off your sunglasses. And you want to know something? Basically, I never did since then. <laughs> He's David Sonnenberg. He still tells, he still reminds me of this story every time I talk to him. Um, but I don't know if you remember Don was. Have you ever seen Don was without his sunglasses on? No. No. David Sonnenberg managed him too. <laughs> so like, like, yeah, da but David Kahn, David Kahn was my mentor. Um, David Kahn is literally, and the word is used too often. David Kahn is literally a genius. Okay. David Kahn produced... Uh, the Bengals walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> okay. David Kahn, like, like he's produced so many big songs and, and I, I'm just so proud to even know him, let alone call him a really good friend. You know, he's a deep dude. Um, you know, I, I mean, but at the moment right now, Tony Maserati, man, you know, he's the man. Everybody knows it. But with me, he's just a great friend and uh, pulled me in. And uh, I don't plan to let him down. There's plenty more people I could mention. But at the moment, I think that's enough. No, that's great. And, you know, it's so funny. Like, sometimes we think that, uh, you know, I shouldn't name anyone because I'm going to forget someone. And right. uh, you can always add. And I just think, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, – uh, your instructor, Kevin, in the beginning, you know, it's funny because one of the reasons why I like to ask questions like that, you know, um, is that, you know, I had the same experience where there was a teacher of mine who, when I moved from pencil, from, from Boston to Pennsylvania, uh, Jack Downs, who could not have been a kinder, gentler soul who made a difficult transition easy for a kid who was like a fish out of water. And I thought about him often. And, uh, and then, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like, you know what? I want to make sure he knows. And I, you know, it was easy to look people up on the internet. And he had died, uh, I believe, like a month earlier. How did he die? I uh, just, I don't know if it was cancer or old age, but, or, or heart condition. Old of age, you know, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, um, but it was one of those things like, you know, we, sometimes we just don't take the opportunities to, we assume that maybe people know that they are important to us. We don't say it out loud. 
So, um, you know, thanks for doing that. Uh, thanks for, for sharing those, not those, those names, um, and those thoughts and, uh, and just your experience. Hey man, you've been an inspiration to me, Bob. <laughs> Back at really? you. Really? But you're yeah. just a good, solid dude. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. This show has reminded you of someone special. Make their day and let them know.